Um, welcome to Sanford Burnham Prep's Discovery Institute's Focus on Cancer Seminar Series. I'm Rob Wexler Rea, Director of the Tumor Initiation and Maintenance Program at Sanford Burnham Previs, and I'll be hosting today's session. Our topic today is cancer modeling and the use of models to identify personalized therapies for cancer patients. We have two exciting speakers, Alice Sarani and Alana Well. Um, I will also introduce uh, Svasti Haricharan, who's the organizer of this series and will be moderating the question and answer session. There will be time for questions after each of the talks, uh, so please type your questions into the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. Just a brief introduction for Alana. Um, Alana Welm received her bachelor's degree from the University of Montana and did her PhD at Baylor College of Medicine and then pursued postdoctoral work with Mike Bishop at UCSF. In 2007, uh, she was hired as an assistant professor at the Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah. Um, she left briefly uh, and then returned to the Huntsman and is now professor in the Department of Oncological Sciences and also Senior Director of Basic Science at the Huntsman. Alana's research is focused on solving the problem of breast cancer metastasis using in vivo models of mouse and human breast cancers. Her group discovered that the Ron kinase pathway is an important facilitator of breast cancer metastasis through its dual function in tumor cells and in resident macrophages. Current areas of research include preclinical studies of RON inhibitors for metastatic breast cancer, discovering the molecular mechanisms by which this pathway promotes metastasis, and refining precision medicine for metastatic breast cancer using functional assays in patient-derived breast tumor grafts and organoid models. Um, Alana's honors include a DOD Innovator and Scholar Concept Award, a Breast Cancer Research Foundation Investigator Award, and a Susan G. Komen Scholar Award and Leadership Grant. Alana is widely known and appreciated in the field for generating innovative models of breast cancer and for sharing these models with other investigators in the field, which has really been a tremendous asset to the field. So Alana, I'm really happy to have you here and um, please go ahead and share your screen. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rob, for this opportunity to speak. And thank you also, uh, Svasti, for the invitation. Um, that was a great talk, Dr. Saragni, and a hard one to follow, but I'll do my best. I'm going to talk about um, patient-derived models for drug discovery and functional precision medicine in breast cancer. And I just want to highlight that this work really is a collaborative effort with my husband, Brian Welm's lab, as well as our medical oncologist collaborator, uh, Chris Baklavas. So um, as many of you probably know, um, breast cancer is an extremely common disease, um, but the real problem in the disease is not the original diagnosis and treatment, it is the uh, distant recurrence that happens in 20 or 30% of cases uh, after a period of no evidence of disease. So um, the patients can undergo uh, systemic therapy that could include hormone therapy or chemotherapy or targeted therapy for HER2 um, positive breast cancer, either before or after surgery. And in general, this uh, takes care of the disease pretty well for some time, but that 20 or 30% of cases eventually recur uh, sometime uh, somewhere in the body, uh, and that causes uh, death from breast cancer. So of course, breast cancer has many um, approved therapies, uh, and most of them are driven by three molecular markers on the tumor. So the hormone receptors, estrogen and progesterone receptor, of course, um, predict good response to hormone therapy. And then we have HER2, um, growth factor receptor, which can be targeted with things like Herceptin or other HER2 targeted therapies. So breast cancer is something that actually has been treated in sort of a precision way for quite some time. Uh, and once the disease is recurrent or advanced breast cancer, there are many approved therapies. So actually in breast cancer, one of the challenges is picking one that's effective um, while not choosing ones that um, are not effective, but yet uh, bring associated toxicities. And uh, the other point I think is that breast cancer is an extremely heterogeneous disease. Um, the the so-called triple negative breast cancers, which lack these three markers, uh, is a huge constellation of different tumors, um, and they can be subtyped into different groups using molecular subtyping. But this still does not dictate um, any particular clinical uh, clinical regimen. 
So the real question we're trying to address here is whether we can do a better job in matching patients with therapies. And of course, as, um, as we already heard, um, the, the gold standard for this is to identify targetable genomic variants. The problem is in breast cancer, there's very few of those. We have a few, um, we have K3 kinase that can now be targeted in advanced breast cancer, but very few of the cases actually qualify for that. Um, we do have these molecular profiles, but again, that's not really used clinically to direct therapy. So where we're trying to go, um, just like we heard of, of the beautiful talk before, is that the functional response is based on these patient tumors. And again, the impact here, although we try to focus on finding effective drugs, uh, it's also very important to realize that we might protect patients from um, you know, toxicity of ineffective therapies that are given essentially on a trial and error basis uh, routinely. So the way we've been going about this is really uh, trying to use patient-derived models of cancer uh, for discovery and treatment. And we started with patient-derived xenografts, as you heard, many years ago. Uh, and actually, we found these to be pretty good models for the patient tumor. We grow these either from primary tumors or from metastatic sites. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but now we're also doing a lot of organoid work. Uh, and over the last several years, we've been really focused on characterizing these models. Um, both in analyzing them to see how well they actually represent the cancer um, that we got. And this is mostly snapshot analysis. So looking at uh, sequencing, gene expression, et cetera. Um, but then we started moving more into functional assessment and asking how does the tumor behave, especially with regard to uh, drug responses and comparing that to the patient responses. So we kind of uh, started moving this into co-clinical models over the years um, because breast cancer patients do still live for quite some time. And as we started to build more and more data to convince ourselves that there was actual fidelity between the models we were developing and uh, the patients, uh, we've now begun to start returning results back to the clinic with the goal here of improving clinical outcomes. And just like in the previous talk, this is in a context of a research study, not in the context of a CLIA certified um, lab. So here's just a quick snapshot of our breast cancer patient drive models. Um, relatively recent, we actually, this paper's under review, but we did post it on BioArchive for those of you who are interested. Um, in our original collection, you know, we had only 12 models or so. And um, we've since expanded these um, with a couple of unmet medical needs in mind, and in particular focusing on the metastatic stage of the disease, um, developing models from things like um, pleural effusions uh, due to lung metastasis, uh, ascites when you have ovarian uh, metastasis, for example, brain mets, bone mets, uh, skin mets, uh, et cetera. Um, and then the other uh, big effort we've made is trying to develop um, longitudinal models from the same patient over time. And this could be um, you know, the, the same uh, metastatic site over the course of different therapies, or it could be primary metastatic pairs where we can look at tumor evolution. So the advantages of these PDX models is in general, they are a pretty good representation of the biology and genomics of the tumors. Of course, they're not perfect. They are still a model and there is some bottlenecking that occurs uh, when these, especially on first passage when they grow in the mice. Um, but I think a really important advancement in the field is that the ER positive tumors uh, in these mice actually do maintain their hormone sensitivity and resistance. And that's really important because we really generally lack models of ER positive and endocrine resistant disease um, because they're, they're not real represented in our genetically engineered mouse models. And then the other important advance of these PDX models is that these um, do actually spontaneously metastasize in the mice. And actually that's the reason we started making these models in the first place was because of um, our dissatisfaction with the metastatic capability of um, established breast cancer cell lines uh, when you put them in vivo. Um, and didn't think that things like cardiac injection were, were probably modeling that process very well. Now they have a lot of disadvantages, as many of you might know. Um, they are labor intensive. Breast cancers, PDX in particular, can be very slow growing, particularly the ER positives. And that makes them expensive and, and really um, only feasible for low throughput studies or validation studies and not for you know, high scale drug response or drug synergy research. And so it was really for those regions that we started developing organoids. And the way the approach we took initially was to um, develop matched organoids from all of our PDX models uh, so that we would have paired in vitro and in vivo models of the same cancer. 
Um, and we, but we also do make organoids straight from the patient as well um, now. So most of what I'll talk about though are these paired models where we can go back and forth. And we've been generally successful at being able to make organoids from most of our models. There's a few that we uh, still have challenges with in particular lobular breast cancers that um, have a mutation in e-cadherin and don't grow in a nice um, uniform way. Um, the advantages of these organoids are that we can do pretty large scale drug screening now, uh, and then we can also play with the culture conditions and add back different cells and, and things like that to uh, look at co-cultures. So just, I'm just going to give you a little bit of data um, just to show you how these uh, models represent each other and the primary tumor. So um, in this case, I'll be showing you some PDX models, uh, the organoids derived from the PDX, which we call the PDXOs. And for some comparisons, we actually engraft these organoids back into mice to make PDXO derived xenografts because that gives us more of an apples to apples comparison, for example, in our RNA-seq analysis. Here's an example of a triple negative breast cancer um, where we're just comparing the histology of the original tumor from the patient. This was actually from her chemo resistant primary tumor um, and what it looks like after we grew it as a PDX. And then again, um, in a PDX, but after it had been through this organoid process and we test both early passage organoids as well as late passage organoids. So that's one difference from Dr. Sorgnani's talk is that we're actually um, doing long-term culturing of these and we actually, um, grow them over multiple passages and we remove the stromal cells and things like that. So there, there are definitely some differences to our approach. If we um, just compare the growth rates of these different types of xenografts in mice, whether it's the original PDX or those that are derived from um, organoids, we see that that growth rate is pretty well retained. And most importantly, um, expression of the estrogen receptors retained. So the, the past example was in a triple negative breast cancer, but I'm showing you here a couple of ER positives. Um, and one of the things that some of the breast cancer aficionados might realize is that when uh, generally when you put cells in 3D, um, the estrogen receptor expression goes down. And this has been a problem with cell line work for many years. Um, and we did in fact see that the RNA levels of estrogen receptor were going down uh, as these were in 3D culture. Um, so we investigated that further. We found conditions where we could retain the estrogen receptor expression. Uh, here we're showing the protein uh, is still there. And then over here, we're showing that these um, organoids do retain their estrogen dependent growth and their, their estrogen dependence. So here um, I'm just showing you a couple different lines um, growing in their normal um, media conditions. Uh, and then if we strip out um, the estrogen by, by charcoal stripping the serum, putting them in um, phenol red free medium, you can see that their growth, uh, basically they die. <laughs> so they're dependent on that estrogen. And this can be rescued by adding back purified estradiol, showing that the effect is really dependent on estrogen. And the same kind of pattern holds true for a known estrogen receptor target gene, TFF1, where you, know, you remove estrogen from the serum, it goes down, and then it can be rescued in the presence of estrogen. Maybe a more robust way to measure um, estrogen dependence of these models is to put them back in mice and treat them with endocrine therapy. Uh, and so we've done this with a number of lines while we're treating with a selective estrogen receptor degrader, uh, full vestrant, which is FDA approved in advanced breast cancer. And you can see that we see a dose dependent um, uh, inhibition of tumor growth uh, with full vestrant in both of these lines. Um, and as a classic endocrine therapy, we actually don't see uh, much shrinkage of the tumor, but we can get uh, we can hold it steady as, as a stable disease, much like what is uh, happening clinically. So what are we doing with all of this? Um, we are one of six centers for um, the NCI's PDX network. So we're one of the PDX development and trial centers. We're the only one focused on breast cancer completely and the only one really doing organoids as the main approach. Uh, and our, um, our concept is to um, basically make um, PDXs that represent at least 100 breast cancer patients. And we do this by combining our collection with Mike Lewis and together we are actually well over hundred models. Um, and then making all of those models into organoids for drug screens. And the idea here is that um, you can identify uh, which drugs are working for which breast cancers and then use our extensive genomics to identify biomarkers of response or resistance. And the goal of this from the NCI perspective, of course, is to um, design better clinical trials uh, for these really heterogeneous diseases like uh, breast cancer, in particular triple negative breast cancer. 
So the way we do this is um, essentially we screen um, against the organoids and we do this um, with a, a drug library that is heavily influenced by what's in the NCI CTEP program, but of course we can include lots of other drugs. We do a very wide dose response range in order to um, allow different drugs to be compared to each other, even though they have widely varying potencies. We do it in 384 well plate and in quadruplicate. And we've uh, repeated our screen at multiple time points because that was one of the concerns we had early on since we are doing long-term culturing of the organoids is would you get the same drug responses um, over you know, short-term passage versus very long-term passage organoids. And actually, um, to my surprise, it, it really is very well reproducible. So I think that's a good sign, although I wouldn't have necessarily thought that. I, I was worried about that, to be honest. So here's an example of just a pilot screen that, that um, we did. And um, the other important point here is that these uh, drug responses in this heat map are actually um, controlled for the growth rate of each model. And the reason for that, again, is we have very heterogeneous growth rates in um, breast cancer. So ER positive grow relatively slow, whereas triple negatives have a really variable growth rate. Some are really fast and others are not. And you can imagine that drug responses are gonna be widely reflective of uh, the, the growth rate of the tumor. And I should say our assay is a six day drug exposure. Um, into the organoids. And so this heat map is essentially normalized to the normal growth rate of each line. Um, and this is a method um, we could talk about more, but this is divided, uh, this is developed by Hafner et al. And I could point you to that paper. So um, the more sensitive um, you know, responses are shown in darker colors. And you can see that um, lines that are happily growing with, with these drugs are uh, shown in yellow. So to first get an idea of how well this is working, uh, we just looked at, well, what are the responses to known drugs? And we have some chemotherapies in our screen. We also have some PI3 kinase AKT mTOR inhibitors, and of course, many others. And what we found is that we can see a statistically significant enrichment, even in this pilot screen, of PI3 kinase AKT mTOR inhibitors selectively um, affecting the hormone receptor positive and HER2 positive breast cancers. Uh, and we can see a significant enrichment for cytotoxic chemo chemotherapy in, um, in affecting the triple negative breast cancers. So that was an early assessment that um, this seemed to be uh, giving us re results that we knew were clinically reasonable and, and you know, based on the approval of those types of drugs. Um, but what we were really looking for here are um, drugs like this. This is um, a smac mimetic called berinopant, uh, which had a really wide ranging efficacy across different models. Uh, and actually I show that um, back here in uh, just the, the raw data heat map where you can see that, you know, even though most of these lines are actually triple negative breast cancers, you can see a really potent effect um, of killing in some lines, whereas they're happily, uh, other lines are happily growing. And so that suggests that there's a subset of cancers that might be susceptible to this particular drug. Uh, we then went on to test that in vivo because remember we have matched in vivo models for all of these organoids. Um, so here again, it's just the organoid sensitivity data that's been rank ordered. So the most uh, sensitive lines on top, least sensitive on bottom. And what you can see is that the triple negative breast cancers or the basal-like breast cancers shown in red are you know, sort of scattered throughout this, um, this uh, sort of efficacy map. So not all triple negative breast cancers are sensitive, um, but the only ones that are really are sensitive tend to be triple negative breast cancer. Uh, when we look at this in vivo, um, what you can see is again, some of the lines are you know, growing happily in the presence of um, these drugs. And I don't have the vehicle only controls on here because it gets too messy, but you can look for it in the paper and, and just trust me that there's no um, inhibition of tumor growth in these uh, triple negative lines. But in these triple negative lines, we see actually complete shrinkage away of the tumors. Um, we've also taken these mice when they have complete responses off therapy and followed them for recurrence and retreated and created some resistant lines and things like that. Um, and so this um, did, in fact, validate the results that we had in organoids. So the next step, of course, is to look into the genomics, figure out the biomarkers of response and resistance to this drug or any other drug that we find um, in, in this case, triple negative breast cancer.
So I think these approaches will help us identify breast cancer drugs for the future. And of course that's our goal, but it also really um, spurned us to say, what can we do right now? And this comes to our functional precision medicine um, part. And the reason why um, this was a burning question in our mind is when we first made our original PDX models that were published back in 2011, we accidentally found retrospectively that even though our take rate is um, less, less than 30%, um, the people whose tumors grew in the mice um, or had positive PDX engraftment um, had all, um, almost all uh, experienced metastatic recurrence and um, a poor outcome. Whereas those who did, whose tumor didn't grow in the mice um, were still alive at five years. And this really suggested that we were sort of selecting for the, the um, breast cancers that were most aggressive and that need uh, new therapies. So um, to test this in a prospective manner, we opened a um, clinical study in collaboration with Cindy Matson and Chris Baklavas, where we enrolled um, triple negative or ER low breast cancer patients and actually also HER2 positive patients. Um, and we biopsied their tumor before they started their therapy. So these are treatment naive breast cancers. And we engrafted them in mice. And the, the hypothesis was if the tumor grew in the mice, then we could predict recurrence um, prospectively. Um, we enrolled 80 patients. This study just closed to accrual. Um, it took us about four years to get to that point. And one of the things we, we looked at was the um, correlation of the engraftment um, with, uh, of, of PDXs with, uh, with recurrence and survival, but we also looked at a known marker, which is whether or not they had residual tumor in the breast at the time of surgery after their neoadjuvant therapy. We know in triple negative breast cancer, which is mostly this cohort, that that is true. Um, there is a significant association with um, survival. In our study, probably because it's so small, we don't see any of effect of PATH-CR uh, correlating with outcome. However, the ability of a tumor to grow in a PDX was strikingly correlated with uh, not only relapse-free survival, but also overall survival of these patients. And actually in the interim analysis um, that was presented at San Antonio last year, um, our, our log rank odds ratio is um, almost 32, showing that there's a very significant um, correlation with tumor engraftment and uh, poor recurrence and poor um, patient outcome. So that really prompted us to say, okay, we, we're predicting recurrence of these um, cancers and we have their model growing, we should really do something about this. And so we started um, making organoids and screening uh, the tumors from these patients, uh, doing the genomics, et cetera. And we can essentially do all of this in the time um, while they're undergoing their standard treatment of their primary tumor before surgery. Most of them go on to uh, get radiation therapy as well. And then we monitor them for recurrence um, with the idea that hopefully if they do recur, we have some information about how um, their tumor might best be treated. And we can do that in the context of a functional precision oncology uh, tumor board. So I'm just going to give a, a case example for this here, um, just one now for the, the sake of time. Uh, this is a, a patient on our study, uh, we call her TO19 or HCI 43. She was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, was enrolled in the TOWARD study. So we um, biopsied her tumor before she started her neoadjuvant chemotherapy with um, dose dense adriamycin, cyclophosphamide, followed by paclitaxel or ACT, we call it. Um, and so uh, we engrafted her, her biopsy tumor and um, it did grow. So the PDX was established. And just based on that in our trial, we predicted that she would have recurrence. Um, and of course, we went on to make organoids from those PDX models. And that was finished um, by the time she had surgery. Interestingly, at the time of surgery, she had a complete pathologic response. She had no tumor detectable in either the breast or the lymph nodes. So clinically, this is a win. And clinically, that would suggest that the patient is going to be, uh, has been definitively treated and will um, be cured. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we had predicted recurrence, so we wanted to know what would happen here. We tested her PDX with the patient matched ACT therapy regimen the best we can. We can't quite get the dose of the doxorubicin or adromycin up as high in mice. As, we, as it happens in the patient. And what you can see here is that this did slow the growth of the tumor, but did not eradicate it. So this sort of, again, um, you know, reinforced our, our prediction of recurrence, but this is not part of our um, endpoint of our trial. 
We also did genomics on this um, on this PDX and actually found that there were no genomically targetable uh, mutations, as is typical in breast cancer. But one thing we did find in the RNA seq data with uh, KT Varley's lab is that this is actually a, a relatively unique and interesting subtype of triple negative breast cancer called uh, LAR or luminal androgen receptor um, breast cancer, which um, basically expresses high level of androgen receptor instead of the estrogen and progesterone receptors. And as a result, maintains a luminal phenotype, even though it's triple negative. And this was interesting because um, when we did single cell RNA-seq, we found that this uh, LAR phenotype was actually present in every tumor clone uh, within at least the PDX that we grew, which kind of suggested that it could be a driver and suggested that maybe we should consider consider an, an androgen antagonist um, in, in, this, um, in this case. So unfortunately, our prediction was correct. This patient did have recurrence um, in the form of liver mets. And this is a timeline you can see. So that was just before 500 days after her original diagnosis. And we were actually blinded to this. Um, and so she went on uh, first line therapy, totally uninformed standard of care therapy, which in this case was capecitabine. Um, we uh, pulled her organoids out of the uh, freezer uh, at that moment and started screening them. And actually, now that we have our data showing how strong our predictor is, we actually screen them up front now. But at that time, we, I guess we hadn't believed our own data as, as much as we do now. We also um, made a PDX from the actual recurrent tumor um, by getting ascites fluid from this patient, made the PDX. We tested again the ACT, so the prediction here would be that since this was recurrent after the therapy, this uh, PDX would be resistant. And in fact, we found it was totally resistant to the AC portion of the regimen, but um, the taxane kind of gave some stable disease, but again, no regression of, of the tumor, which was consistent from this for the, with this being a chemo-resistant um, sample. When we screened the organoids, um, we actually tested a lot of FDA approved therapies, including those that she got. Those are shown in gray, as well as uh, new therapies. And there's a few I point out here. So this is doxorubicin and this is paclitaxel. So part of that ACT regimen. And you can see that there is some response to that, which is consistent with the slowing of the tumor growth in the PDX and the fact the patient had a complete response in the breast, um, but wasn't you know, the, the most potent therapy uh, in this patient. Um, we also tested some drugs for which she had access to clinical trials, including cabozatinib and talazaparib, and those were kind of lukewarm responses in our study. Um, and lastly, I'll point out um, 5-FU, which is the active metabolite of the capecitabine that she got for first-line recurrent disease, uh, which in our assays was completely uh, ineffective. When we tested the, the sort of front runners in our in vivo model in PDX, we tested enzalutamide um, because that was the only thing we found with the genomics only uh, informed therapy. And you can see again, it slowed tumor growth, but did not cause any regression. The tumor is still slowly growing. And uh, we got stable disease with the two clinical trial drugs, cabozatinib and talazaparib. But the real winner here was the one we had predicted from the organoid screen, which is aribulin. And this is FDA approved for advanced breast cancer. And so so that seemed like a good candidate. In the mice, we got complete responses. Um, we did get a few recurrences off therapy when we followed these mice, but um, a single dose of aribulin, again, complete with, completely wiped them out. We could never select a resistant um, tumor in mice. So um, what did we do next? Um, we returned our results um, per the IRB protocol back to the clinic. Now, again, we're not a CLIA certified lab. The physician can choose to use the information or not. And in fact, in this case, because the patient had a little bit of pdl one positivity in her tumor, she um, went on a clinical trial with the cabozatinib and um, atizolizumab. Um, and unfortunately that was not effective. And eventually she did go on a ribulin. And so um, this aribulin treatment actually resulted in a complete radiographic response. Um, all her liver mets disappeared, her ascites fluid disappeared for quite some time. And so we were quite excited, but unfortunately she did get a, an isolated bone met that appeared. Um, and, uh, off, and, and so the physicians took her off this therapy. She got radiation to the bone met. And then while she was off therapy for some time, um, eventually those liver mets came back and uh, the next line therapy also was not effective. So um, I think the, the way that I would look at this is it's not a complete win because um, she did um, progress and eventually die of her disease. But the um, informed therapy was actually more successful than any of the previous therapies she had in her um, advanced breast cancer. And so this 
um, progression-free survival ratio of the inform to the prior therapy, in this case is 3.7, which I think is important because in the Moscato 1 trial, this the benchmark of success, which is a genomics-only precision medicine trial, uh, the benchmark of success was a PFS ratio of 1.3. So we have some questions, of course, here. We don't know if her bone met was a new clone that's resistant to aribulin or simply wasn't represented in our PDX models. Um, as um, we previously heard, tumors can change with therapy. And we don't know if her liver met that recurred off therapy would have then been sensitive again if, we had, if she had gotten aribulin. And these are all questions that I think we need to pursue. I'm just gonna end here by um, essentially saying that where we're going is to try to develop infrastructure to do this faster in the metastatic disease um, and to see if we can build clinician confidence in, um, in uh, this type of an approach. So we've just opened a new um, uh, precision medicine trial um, doing the same type of thing, but in the metastatic setting and because of fast turnaround time, only using organoids and not using um, the PDX. So with that, I'll, I won't tell you too much more about this trial because of time, but I just wanna thank the people who uh, did the work. They're shown here in bold for, for this particular work. Um, our collaborators, um, our physician collaborators obviously are essential for this work as well as patients. Uh, and the funding that we use uh, to do the work. So with that, I'll stop and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Wow, thank you, Alana. That was a, that was a brilliant talk, really. Um, I have a lot of questions. There are a few questions in the chat as well. But um, I'm really curious as to whether you think that, you know, with the, with the one patient, the case study that you were talking about, do you think that the fact that you didn't pick up on uh, the, the recurrence of the bone met or a recurrent clone in the mice. It's just because we know mice metastasize differently from, from patients, right? So is there is there a potential that this um, tool will be more useful for maybe certain types of metastases while it might not provide full information on other types just because it's immune compromised it's mice and they're just so different? Yeah, that's a great question. And I should point out that all of our PDX work for this type of trial is being done in the primary site. So we put the tumors in the mammary fat pad and that's what we're measuring. So we didn't actually look to see whether those mice got bone mets and whether we treated them. Um, but in our research studies, of course, we do a lot of that. So I think that there will be um, questions about whether certain metastatic sites can be well represented in PDX models, um, et cetera. Good question. Okay. And, and then uh, another question along those lines, and I think it's also a great question, is how, can, how scalable is this? Like, I, I know you've done it for 100 patients or more, but can we do it for every patient? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think that is one of the caveats of this. Um, so the best example I can give you is we know now, I mean, the data on the engraftment of the PDX and recurrence is really remarkable. Um, and, and we don't have anything like that clinically for triple negative breast cancer, right? So um, we, we, we need to pursue this, but growing everyone's tumor or attempting to grow everyone's tumor in mouse is not gonna be the right way. So, so the way that we're doing this is really to try to find a surrogate biomarker. What's different about the tumors that can grow versus the ones that can't grow? And um, you know, really then develop that into a different type of a biomarker that could predict recurrence. That, you know, I actually think one of the most interesting things uh, in the entire talk was this idea of the negative data, right? So basically what couldn't grow uh, was telling us something. But uh, one of the questions that came up, uh, which is also interesting, is when you were looking at the survival data based on your growth of PDXs, do you take into account all of the already standard known risk factors? Or do you take into account, like, is it all just driven by, we know ERPR positive or more indolent, right? So maybe they just don't grow as opposed to, we're really picking yes. up. Driver. Good question. So actually, in our original study, we found that that was subtype agnostic. It was kind of all comers, but we found it was still independent of all clinical variables that, that we use in a multivariate analysis. In our prospective study, we actually only enrolled ER low or pretty much negative um, patients. So this is really uh, something I think we can do for the triple negatives. The problem with the ER positives, as you know, the take rate of PDX will be lower, the recurrence rate overall can be lower, but it takes decades sometimes for recurrence. So it's really hard to, to do that in a clinical study. Yeah, yeah, I can see how this would be a lot more challenging for ER positive as usual. Yes. Um, can I ask Alice, can, can you join us as well, uh, turn on your video and unmute so we can get some common questions. One of my favorite questions that came up and I actually put it in the dismiss list so Alice wouldn't answer it before I could get both of you on. 
um, one of my favorite questions, and I think you both will, might have different responses for this, is uh, what do you think is the potential for using your tool or technology to take this from this individual patient that you're growing an organoid or tumor to expanding it to say all patients with this marker or this profile can be treated with these same drugs? Is, do you think that's possible or are we really just moving towards a unique, every patient gets their own unique medication. Dr. Saragni, do you want to take that first? Sure. Um, so my hope is to be out of business, you know, in the in the future. So I mean, of course, these, even if we can do literally hundreds of patients is not scalable per se, right? Not every patient and there is, there is a little bit of a disparity issue there, right? Like it's a very specific set of patients that have access to a very specific set of institution where these type of things are done. They aren't cheap, you know, they are still labor intensive. And so, so there are a lot of limitations. So the way in which we are approaching these, I'm working with a couple of colleagues uh, from Pete and the University of Colorado and trying to harvest this data uh, through machine learning and try to come up with those biomarkers that will kind of free us, you know. Um, so, you know, we're doing this thing called transfer learning, where you can learn things from different cancers, apply them to the type of tumors we are um, studying, powered by the data we are generating, right? And so, again, um, I would cherish the day where this type of things is not needed anymore, because obviously, no matter what, no matter how much money you have, it's not entirely scalable. That would be my answer. I agree with that. And I would say, yes, of course, biomarkers are the way to go and it's gonna be complicated. Machine learning, I think is gonna be critical. But the other really critical thing that I wanted to point out again is, you know, the devil's in the details, right? So you'll only get as much information as, um, as what you put in. So the challenge here, again, is tumor heterogeneity and things like stromal content. Because in breast cancer, for example, if we get a biopsy from liver, we get a biopsy from the breast, you have very different stromal content and amount of stroma. And actually, that's one of the reasons we decided to go to long-term cultures is because we had a problem with certain tumors having an aggressive stroma that would kind of take over. Uh, and um, we were worried that that would affect not only our drug responses, but also you know, the genomics profiling that we get out, the gene expression signatures, et cetera. The, and the choice was either we go to single cell RNA-seq uh, or we go to um, a more pure culture. And because we were doing this as part of this big um, PDXNet effort, we decided to go toward the more pure culture, try to gain as much data as we can with as many drugs as we can, as many models as we can to make those signatures. And then we need to go back and see how well does that predict um, co-clinical, you know, uh, responses in co-clinical studies where you do patient match therapy. Do you, and do you both think also that, you, you know, since you both have, we're do, are doing similar things and trying to cycle it back to the clinic, do you think that using something like this say, to have a really informed approach to precision medicine. Do you think that that would, do you think, for example, the reasons we don't have that good response is because we wait so long and we treat with so many different therapies before we find the one that works? That one, I mean, the tumor is growing, but also a lot of these therapies are toxic. And so, you know, the patients aren't doing very well either on them. So do you think that this could really change that dynamic, make it it would like actually have cures instead of just this progression pre survival metric, which is so disappointing. I hope so. Actually, to be honest, the, the whole reason why this project even got started in my lab was because when I first started my lab as an assistant professor, I decided to spend some time in the clinic. Um, and, and what I realized that was that a lot of the assumptions I made as a scientist were completely wrong. Uh, and um, that the way breast cancer was really treated was by trial and error. And, and not only trial and error, but, um, but things like, well, we live in a, the Intermountain West. We're the only cancer center within a huge uh, geographic area. And so many of our patients come from rural areas or Wyoming or Idaho someplace. And, and so a lot of the therapy choices actually like, well, an oral drug instead of one that is IV where you have to come every week, or I don't wanna lose my hair. So let's pick something different. And there was many things that went into therapy choice that were not scientifically you know, driven. 
And the, but the trial and error nature, and nature of it really said, wow, we have to do something different <laughs> to better understand why some tumors respond to things or not because the toxicities do accumulate uh, really severely actually. Yeah, and I mean, if I can add something, I would say, you know, for it may not be universally true, of course, but at least for the type of tumor we handle, um, the way in which they evolve under therapy pressure, it's scary. It's really scary. It's like it's something you can think of, but when, when you see the data, I think, you know, it's incredibly concerning. And so, and so the reality is that I think this type of technology would be better deployed very early, very early. But then that's not what you can do, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot really start implementing. And so, and so there is this conundrum, right? So like um, what Dr. Wellman was showing is beautiful study of this patient that sure, I mean, it didn't entirely succeed, right? But if you could implement this type of technologies very early on, right? Um, you cannot. And so, and so at the end, you don't really cure the patient anymore, right? But that disease down there after it's seen so many therapies is not, I don't think it's curable. I mean, that's probably the reality of it. And so, you know, uh, it's going to be challenging find that um, that spot, that sweet spot, right? Where you can get these type of technologies approved, um, but working on patients which are in a very late stage um, and then try to work your way backwards. So. so can I push back just a little bit on what I think both of you said, which is that um, our goal is to put ourselves out of business. And and part of the reason for that is <laughs> part of the reason for that is because uh, this is this is really challenging. It's hard to to scale, and I think that if the country had not invested in genomics the way it has, the way it did 10, 15 years ago, we would have said the same thing about that. Probably the way that our um, that your versions and and we're doing this as well at Brady Children's Hospital, the way that the high throughput drug screening works um, is scalable if we invest in those resources. And what we found is that the both the turnaround time, we get our functional data much faster than we get our genomic data. And we get our functional data much cheaper than we get our genomic data. And, it, and ours is CLIA certified. So I think that with the appropriate investment, you could do this. And the question is, how much do you believe that we will, that machine learning or predictive biomarker analysis will get us what we're getting from functional precision medicine? And to what extent would this still be a better bet than trying to guess what this patient might respond to? I think it's a great point. Uh, and yeah, you're right. If we, if we, with the resources we currently have, it's not really feasible, but I think yeah. we could, right. We could, we could turn the corner and, and do something different. And I do think that I would always be more confident in actually seeing the response, uh, particularly if it's, um, you know, the problem is that you're always a little bit behind, right? Because the patient will have progression, you, you biopsy, you do the screen, but like what Alice is doing is fast enough, right? Her, her turnaround time is fast enough that, um, that you could probably keep up. PDX, you cannot, at least in breast cancer, PDX, you cannot keep up. We have to move into yeah. the ex vivo systems. But, you know, in terms of the feasibility as well, how, how easy is it, say, in your model, Alice, to include stromal components or to include immune cells? Like, is there a way to make the model a little more complex? Yeah, so um, what we do, um, because of the short time, and I think what Dr. Warren said, it, it makes sense, right? So stroma can take over. Um, it's sometimes very aggressive. Um, but it's also very important. There is a whole body of literature out there showing how it's really crucial to drug response as well. And so we do like to have this stroma there, but what's really important for us is to keep the ratio between stromal cell and tumor cell the same as it's in the tumor. So that's kind of where we're going from. And that number changes, and that's true. But because of the uh, you know, deep genomics, we do have that number exactly, right? So we kind of know what we have in there, um, which doesn't mean we know how to account for it in drug response, but we know what we have in there. That's kind of where we are at. In terms of adding the immune cells, we are trying to develop an immunocompetent platform for you know, IO drug studies. 
challenging. So we are trying to take immune cells from the patient and develop these, you know, co-culture models where you can test um, not only small molecules, but, you know, immune oncology only, but you can actually combine the two, which I think is going to be a very powerful mm -hmm. tool if we can kind of find a way to do this successfully and particularly measure responses in a way that makes sense. Um, it's a work in progress. We, we, we don't have yet that developed, but we are trying to develop an immune oncology platform. You can do that, right? So that's the beauty. If you need a liver, you cannot deliver. If you need your immune cells, you can add your immune cells. You know, how well you do that, that's a different issue and it's a lot of work, but I think it's for, a lot of people are trying to do that. And I think it's gonna be really important. Do we have time for me to ask a question to Alice? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really curious. So, so this problem of tumor heterogeneity, I think about this a lot. And it's not only the heterogeneity within the tumor that you sample, but it's the heterogeneity of the cancer in the body. Um, like my bone met example in the patient with uh, recurrent liver disease. So um, the way I thought about this is maybe there's a way to sample the whole tumor burden through circulating tumor cells, for example. And I know that works really well in non -small, or in small cell lung cancer, not very well in breast. I wonder in sarcomas, is that a possibility to try to capture the disease of the, of the you know, since you can grow these in such small little mm -hmm. spheres, can you, can you try it from CTCs? So we haven't done that. We have been talking about trying to do that. There are obviously circulating tumor cells in sarcoma. I guess, you know, there is a question as to where these cells are coming from. Even patients which are, you know, diagnosed metastatic at presentation, obviously there are, you know, bigger tumors in some places and smaller mats in other places. So I guess, you know, how much they shed, that may be questionable, but but you can recover sarcoma tumor cells from the blood. And so, the, and there is some like brilliant work being done developing organoids from circulating tumor cell, which I think it's, uh, it's fascinating. We haven't done that yet, but um, I agree, you know, I don't know if we can capture everything, but it would be worth trying most definitely. It's mm -hmm. a fantastic point, yeah. In breast cancer, we just have too few of them. Um, at, and, and they're so density dependent in their growth that we haven't been successful yet. We'll see. All right, so in the interest of time, we're gonna have to end uh, much though I'd like to just continue chatting about this. Um, but I know I'm supposed to give a plug to next month's Cancer Center Seminar Series. And actually we've set it up really well because it's gonna be about genomics in precision medicine. So we'll see what these guys have to say in defense of that. Um, thank you, Alana and Alice, and thank you, Rob.